of the fallen. Tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save him. Number 391 on the second. Though they are sliding him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently. He will forgive if they only believe. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, Feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness, chords that are broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Amen. You may be seated. One more? All right. Let's do a uh, second one. Uh, what number is that? Sorry, Pastor. Sure. Number 344. Higher ground, hymn number 344, I'm pressing on the upward way, hymn number 344. Stand right there. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound. My, print my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table and a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world. Though Satan's darts at me are hurled, for faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table and a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table and plain that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Amen.
Uh, maybe not enough. Maybe I need to go outside for a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to run outside while you guys are here. Where are they? All right. Anyway. Sometimes I believe the devil tries to attack me when I'm at my, when my physically when I'm at my, you know, weakest point. And uh, yeah, he's bound. <laughs> sure wish that was the case, man. <laughs> But I'm telling you, I know when the devil tries to jump on me. And uh, this this war that we are in is a real war. And um, it has e eternal ramifications. And uh, I do believe, I I do believe that he hates this ministry. And the impact that it has, and um, <laughs> I know what the Apostle Paul meant when he said, "He said inward were fears, and you know, as as he struggled and as he fought, and you know, I I know the devil comes after me at different times in my life and different points where, when I feel like I'm in the thick of a battle, or even when I'm when the battle's over and a victory has been there." Uh, when that particular battle's over, I, I know he he tries to weigh on me and come after me. Um, so you just pray for me to get through this. And uh, I want to read you something here just from a real quick before we get started here. Some encouraging note um, from a man in New Zealand. He says, uh, hello, Pastor Jason Cooley. Greetings from Christ Church, New Zealand. He said, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for your YouTube presentations. I recently came across them and decided to watch them. Found them most interesting and inspiring, absolutely mind-provoking. You have most certainly challenged and encouraged me in my walk with the Lord, and for that I thank you. I truly respect and appreciate you. The Lord bless you and your ministry in mighty ways. I encourage you to keep up the good fight. You're making a difference. My prayers and thoughts are with you all. All the best, Jason. God bless. And, um, you know, I, I think about the Lord sends those, um, the Lord sends those encouraging, you know, notes and, and things like that to me all day long, it seems like, or, or many times in a day. And uh, people that have been blessed by the ministry and that the Lord is is using the bold stands and things that most people don't want to hear, but God is calling a remnant out. And uh, because there's, there's a major war ahead, you know, and it's, it's coming. And I believe the Lord is preparing us for that battle, uh, that war that I, I, I believe there's a preparation for that. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't want to hear that. They want to hear that everything's going to be easy, quick, and we're going to just leave. I don't believe that. I believe there's a war ahead. I believe there's one now. There's one every day that we fight. We fight it daily, but there's one ahead, and each one is preparing us for this. It's the only thing that I can, by the power and grace of God, it's the only thing that makes sense to me why God would move and lead a man to come visit from New York, okay? It's not anything to do with anything in me personally, but it's the work, it's the call of God that it's the, it's the power of God that comes and that's how you see people influenced all over the world in different areas. Um, men that have, have sent emails are called, and they were encouraged by what the Lord was doing. And that brings great humility and fear to me as well, and it shows me the responsibility that I have, you know, to keep, exactly, to keep honoring God's Word and keep giving the truth no matter who likes it, you know. and. Um, a lot of people can't handle that, you know, but there are, there is a remnant out there that can, you know, and they want the truth and they feel like when they hear it, they're encouraged by it and they're, they're emboldened to do something for the Lord themselves right where they're at. You know, we may never see some of these people, some of them may not be fortunate enough to drive here, you know, and some of them are in other countries. Some of them are, you know, in the Amazon, some of them are, some of them are, um, you know, in Africa and, and um, they're in Asia, they're, they're, they're all over the, the world. 
but they're encouraged and they turn it on and they're, and they're able to, they appreciate that strong stand where some other people are like, what are you yelling about? What are you getting so excited about? What's, you know, isn't America great? I mean, <laughs> you all right, Brother Aaron? <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> it's great. Yeah, I watched 200,000 people last night come down and watch a guy slide down a slide. I think America's doing great. We're not in any trouble. We're not in any trouble. We're doing just fine. Hey, keep the circus going. Keep the circus going. And what's happening is we have so many people that they are, they are just hypnotized by the prosperity of America. They're absolutely hypnotized by it. It's distracted them completely from the things of God. They're just distracted. Absolutely distracted from what they're to be paying attention to. I mean, you, they think America's a Christian nation. You walk out there and, and, and you see the, the, the stuff that we've seen last night. You know why most of them think that? Because they don't go engage sinners. That's why. Pastors never leave their pulpits to go engage sinners and really get a feel for what people are really thinking out there. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy to hide. You and I can hide. I could hide. I mean, I could just, I could just, you know what? The one part of this ministry that I could do is just preach from this pulpit and broadcast it out, and many people would still come. They would still come. I mean, they would still listen, that is. They would still listen from out there. But because we don't only do that, we go out there. It has encouraged many other people to get out there and do what they can for the Lord. And you know we need to we need to keep pressing on and uh, let the Lord use us because it is having an impact on many out there. Many. You know when you can't when you see people that aren't willing to drive across the street, brother. We have people that live right across the street who wouldn't even walk across the parking lot to come to church. Somebody drives from New York. Or 80 miles away, pretty much 80. <laughs> well, we didn't go that far. But... Okay, okay. They do. Yeah, they do hate Christ. That's right. They hate the Christ of the Bible. <clears throat> the Antichrist will embrace them. <clears throat> Him they'll love, the Bible says. Him they'll receive. But the one of the Bible is too straight and narrow. Christ of the Bible is too straight and narrow for them. They won't, um, they won't receive him. You know, they, they don't want him. He's, he's, the t he's the one that that makes things too plain. Leaves them with no excuse. If we really, if we would determine, Nate's going to talk about, you're going to talk a little bit about relativity, right? You're going to preach about that in the afternoon service and you know, I was thinking about that, and if we would just have right is right and wrong is wrong, we'd be just fine. If we just lived our life by right is right and wrong is wrong, and I'm not going to I'm not gonna live in the land of make-believe, the land of the gray area, the land of relativity. Yeah. Straight in the depths of hell. It says education without Christ is Gnosticism. Witchcraft, plainly seen. All right. Well, anyway, I'm starting to feel better a little bit. I'm starting to wake up. So um, I tell you, I was feeling pretty rough, but uh, for a little while there. But the Lord will sustain me. Amen. <clears throat> Genesis chapter six, please. I'm going to try to Genesis chapter six. We'll see how long I go with this. Aaron, I might have you stop the file. I may pick it up in the afternoon if I have to and have Brother Nate preach right after me. So we may do that still. We'll see how it goes, okay? Um, but Because um, I do want to finish this today. But there's plenty of time. It's not that long, really, I don't believe. But uh, Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 1. 
Wow, we just recorded this all the way through, Brother Aaron. We're just keeping the whole thing on. Okay. <clears throat> Amen. All right. We talked about the giant cities, giant structures, giant tools, and things of that nature. Um, Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 1 says this, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the, and the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Only evil continually. Listen, folks, I want you to remember one thing out of this. Go back and listen to the two sermons that we've preached on this, but you, you, you keep your thoughts in subjection to Christ. Keep your imagination in subjection to Christ. That is the one place the devil likes to attack is your imaginations. And in the, in the New Testament era, the Bible talks about the imagination a lot, about dreams and daydreaming and things like that, to keep your thoughts in check, because if your thoughts are under the obedience of Christ, your actions will be too. That's how it works. It's not the other way around. Amen? It's your thoughts. Place them under Christ, under His sovereignty, under His rule. If it's not biblical, repent of it. Don't think of it. Don't think on that. Don't allow yourself to think about things and, and, and revel in wickedness and evil thoughts. Look what God did because of their thoughts. You and I believe that we can get away with that. No, we can't. We can't. We have to be careful. Amen? We have to be careful. We have to put every thought in the, the, in the subjection to Christ, under obedience to Jesus Christ. So we have, these, we have these giants here. Well, have they found any? Are there any giants out there that, have, that, that they've found? Are there any records of any giants out there? So we see the record of the Scriptures. I believe the Scriptures. That's all I need to see. I don't need to see a skeleton. I don't need to see any remains. It's kind of interesting, though, when you do, though, isn't it? I think it's kind of fascinating that we find in history, we find a lot of articles. I'm going to read you some, too. I don't, I've got to get moving here, but I'm going to read you some of these articles. This little, little newspaper. In the newspaper, could you imagine that they would ever print that in the newspaper today? Never see it. Never see anything like that. Why? Because... Well, because the media is ran by the devil, that's why. I didn't know Rupert Murdoch was a devil. Yeah, he is a devil. He's not the devil, but he is a devil. Fox News. Fair and balanced. <laughs> what a bunch of lies. How do you even print that? How do you even put that on a website? Fair and balanced. <laughs> yeah, Bill O'Reilly's fair and balanced. He's a Jesuit. All under Jesuit training, every single one of them can be proven. All connect to the Knights of Malta. What's Rupert Murdoch, Nate? What, what order is he out of? Knight of St. Gregory. Oh, you mean he's under the control of the Pope too? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Printing Bible, printing NIVs, and, 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 and owned Zondervan too, or had the rights to Zondervan as well. Printing some King James Bibles. Making money while he's making money for his pornography kingdom that he has. Wicked man. Wicked, wicked man. Oh, do you have to be so, do you have to cut it so straight? Couldn't you just leave me some room? Couldn't you leave me some room to be fooled by a bunch of devils? No, sorry. Can't leave you any room to be fooled by them. Got to just expose them, make you mad so you can go home and pout about it. But hey, would you rather them lie to you or me lie to you? Because I'm just going to tell you the truth. Because I don't make millions of dollars to lie to you. Like they do. <sighs> anyway. All right. Well, we see here uh, about these giants. Josephus made an interesting, interesting uh, entry here um, about some things in his writings. 
It says here, it's, it's difficult to know what giants really look like, but their physical traits have been described in many old writings. Josephus, who was a, a, a very renowned um, historian, I mean, in, he was in Christ's time. Josephus said their faces were different from normal men. Other ancient accounts say the same thing. The fact that many of them had two rows of teeth might have made a difference in their expressions. Well, I'd say that'd make a little bit of a difference. <laughs> And the amount of food that they eat. <laughs> you imagine having a potluck for giants? That would be rough. I, I, think, I think you would be on the menu if we had that for giants. I think you would be on the menu of that. I think you'd be part of that. You'd be part of that menu. You are the potluck. <laughs> But anyway, other ancient accounts say the same thing. The fact they had many, that many of them had two rows of teeth might have a difference, make, make a difference in their expressions. It may, it, may, it may be that they had fierce and angry countenances, thus distorting their faces. There are also many ancient sculptures and bas reliefs of men who tower over other adult men. Some of it may have been because the kings, etc., were pictured as larger, even though they were not in reality twice the size of abnormal, as of normal, but because they were kings. Ancient men, especially leaders such as kings and others who were worshipped as gods, tended to be depicted with very tall headdress, headdresses and horns. Jupiter, for instance, was listed as the name of one, for one of the fallen angels. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Hmm. The sculpture of him with slanted eyes and full lips is depicted a real person. It's a picture of a fallen angel. I cannot say conclusively these are the representations of actual giants or angels. Here are some examples of men that they depicted. And this is one of Gilgamesh, said to be a giant part divine. That's Nimrod or Gilgamesh. He's holding a tiger or a lion or whatever in his hand. and he's, It's like a full-size cat, you know. He's just holding it. It's like gripping it, you know. Like you would hold the kitty cat. Right, Brother Aaron? <clears throat> What's that? If you wanted to hold a cat. I don't want to. All right, page number 35 here, this book, Alaskan Illusion Giants here that, that they have here. On the Alaskan Illusion Island of Shem Shemya, during World War II, a bulldozer cut through layers of sedimentary rock to put in an airstrip and in doing so uncovered a graveyard of giant men. Their skulls measured from 22 to 24 inches from top to bottom. This is about three times the size of normal human, making them about 18 to 20 feet tall. The skulls were said to have been tree panned. That is, holes had been cut out of their skulls. This is seen in Peru with most of them surviving as evidence of, by the regrowth of bone and the incision often more than once. That's interesting there. Dwarf mammoths have been found on the Aleutian Islands. He said, I restored a beautiful tusk of one in 2007. Islands in California have remains of dwarf mammoths that appear to have been butchered and cooked. Perhaps these giants were eating mammoths. Oops, that would be a problem for evolution. Mammoth hunters were supposed to be small and not too bright. We don't, and what would an evolutionary person do with that, a, a teacher of evolution? He would throw out the evidence and say, well, that can't be. Why? Well, because the hunters were small, so... <laughs> they were small and dumb. So that can't be true, so throw it out. That, they do that all the time. That's what they do with evidence. They just throw it away. Because it doesn't fit their model. So they just throw it away. All right. Uh, page number 36 here in this book. Interesting. Um, uh, let's see. The giants here. Uh, giant petrified man of Colorado. The Denver Tribute of Denver, Colorado report on... October 17th, 1881, that a man named Jacob Daniels, who lived along Running Creek, Colorado, some 45 miles north of Denver, Colorado, about where the modern-day town of Longmont is located, when digging in the area, found the remains of a petrified man 13 feet long. Unfortunately, like all hundreds of other giant men found while digging by the hand in 1800s, their ability to preserve them or to store them was inadequate and they were obtained by curiosity seekers and eventually destroyed or ended up in major museums' basements and forgotten. That wasn't on purpose or anything. A giant, giant tracks in the Grand Canyon sandstone. Samuel Hubbard, who, who found over 50 giant men, 10 to 14 feet tall. 
and two even larger in sandstone further claimed to have found a sandstone layer in the Grand Canyon of Arizona with numerous human tracks in it, including some of giant measuring, 17 to 20 inches long. Other animal tracks were found in the same layer, including layer of sandstone. But because there are mammoth and tiny horse prints, there it makes me tend to think they are post-flood. It could be there, he says. Okay, in Kossuth, Iowa, giant mummies. This story about giant mummified men who were 10 feet tall is really strange. The only photograph that I am aware of purporting to be one of the giant Kossuth mummies is also said by some to be that of a midget. That'd be interesting. Of course, the story about it being a midget it may not be true. So being forewarned, take the story with that in mind. So he, gives, he goes on to explain the story of a well-hard stone at 9 feet. The stone was not local to eastern Iowa. Friends helped him excavate a massive stone floor or ceiling of 188 foot square made up of irregular cut stones all about eight foot by 10 but fitted so he's saying there were seven giant mummies that were found in there now do i believe every account no but do i believe some of them well you would have to when you see the same accounts over and over again from different people that don't know anybody before there was an internet before there was was a way to contact everybody around the world these people independent stories all over the world no they're not making that up okay they're not making that up there's something going on amen there's something something happening there okay um and there's an iowa giant buried in solid granite bedrock in, many, in one of the many conversations that have been my privilege to hear, someone related to me that the human skeleton 12 feet long had been discovered in a casket carved in solid granite bedrock in Iowa of all places. In Iowa of all places. The bones, he was told, were petrified. It wasn't stated that the bones were encased in some sort of matrix in the casket. It may have been clay. Here is a pretty good chance that the man may have been buried before Noah's flood. Since granite is bedrock as opposed to sandstone or limestone, which are sedimentary, it is more probable that he was buried before sedimentary rock was laid down in the flood. So a 12-foot long man said probably pre-flood. I don't know. Okay? I don't know. I know they found a 12-foot tall man, though. Okay? That's what they did find. I, we don't know when and what time because we know there's others that, that make up some of that. But these are not isolated incidences. They, these are, I mean, they're, they're not all lying these people are not all lying there's why would they lie what what i mean who digs a rock they don't have a religious need need to prove giants are real you know these are just people that were digging in their backyard or digging in a cave somewhere digging and all of a sudden they unearth this box or this tomb or something or they unearth this skeleton they're like hey i gotta tell somebody about this wouldn't you if you were digging your backyard and you're like whoa and all of a sudden you pulled something out and it was 12 feet long and it was a man like i gotta tell somebody don't tell the Smithsonian, okay? Or the government. Get a hold of a creation scientist. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah, they do put them in jail, don't they? That's true. They, are, they do go to jail. All right, page 38 here. In this book, Nevada, in Nevada, a giant man in mammoth footprints. Oh, that might be a problem. In 1882, uh, convicts working at a quarry at the state prison near Carson City, Nevada, uncovered a layer of sandstone covered with fossil animal tracks, those of the supposed extinct mammoth being the largest. But even more impressive was a series of giant, of giant man tracks 19 to 20 inches long. A geolo geologist named Joseph Laconte reported that California Academy of Science that they were probably the prints of a giant sloth. He was quickly contradicted by others stating that the giant sloth uses his huge tail for support when walking on two hind feet. Sloth feet don't look human anyway, and they, they leave claw marks. In 1980, I saw a large latex mold of some of these tracks at the George C. Page Museum of the La Brea Tar Pits, probably made in the late 70s. Just Having gotten involved in paleontology, I didn't realize their significance, nor did I have a camera handy. The fact that these tracks were in sandstone makes me think they were pre-flood. Hmm. Interesting. So another one that's been found there uh, that, you know, nobody else knew about. A uh, lot, of, lot of tracks were found. Let's see, I'm going to move forward here to page 45 to read you some more accounts of this. Lots of interesting things here. All right, page number 45 here in, in France. 
Now, this is interesting. Okay, now don't get scared on me here, okay? In 1456, giant bones were found, including a vast skull and some immense teeth beside a river near Valence, France. The skull measured about three feet wide. One shoulder blade was allegedly nine feet across. I don't know. I didn't find it, okay? One expert on giants determined it may have been a giant man some 23 feet tall. I question the nine-foot scapula. So do I. It would have been a one-third of the man's height. A, real, a really big mammoth has a skull about three feet wide and only has a scapula about three feet long. Perhaps they found a dinosaur. They are found in France, but a really big... They aren't found... Or they are found in France, he says. But a really big sauropod only has a scapula of about five feet long. So while the report seems fantastic, it is doubtful that they found an animal skeleton and mistook it for a giant man. So they could have. But anyway, the point is that they found something that large, okay, which is a denial of, of everything. Well, how could you, wait a minute, how could you find it there? How could you find it there if evolution is true? It's not possible for you to find that, is it? It doesn't make any sense, does it? All right, how about, oh boy, these, yeah, some of these get weird, okay. How about the Mediterranean Cimmerian Bosporus giant, 36 feet tall. During an earthquake in the Cimmerian Bosporus, year is not known, a hill or possibly a burial mound split open, revealing enormous bones that when assembled as a human skeleton were 36 feet tall. Howworth tended to believe many giant men were only mammoth skeletons. The longest mammoth femur I know of was found by John, Johnny Redding and Wayne Parker in Garza, Colorado, Tech, Garza, Colorado, Texas, probably in the 1960s or 70s. It was six feet long. This is how long a 36-foot tall man's femur would be. While a mammoth skull looks human, if the tusks were there, would it be mistaken for a man? No, I don't think so. So 36 feet tall. Probably, obviously, probably pre-flood, okay? But because uh, things were bigger then and everything like that. You, said, you really believe that? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know how tall it was, but I don't think all these people are making it up, especially people hundreds of years ago. Why would they care if they found – why would they need to make it up? What would be their purpose? It's not like they're going to get anything. Nobody around the world is going to hear about it or anything. You know, they're out in the middle of nowhere, these people are. The, Car the Carthaginian giant, 36 feet tall. According to Amachius, in his, in his paragesis, the Carthaginians were digging a ditch around their territory for protection when they uncovered two enormous skeletons, one 36 feet tall, one 36 feet long, and a second at 34 feet, about 100 years before Christ. They found that. Okay. So, um, a few, a few extra, I'll read you a few more of these, and we'll get into, into some other facts here, uh, some things. Uh, African giants, they found some African giants here uh, on page, let's see, where is it at, 51 here. Uh, the African tribesmen knew about the giants. In September of 2000, a man named James W. List of the Rock Ministries International, who held some seemingly odd religious beliefs, but was apparently not crazy, was discussing his work in Africa with me. He told me that they found closed clams in the Kalahari a thousand miles from the ocean way out that is now desert way out in what is now desert but was at this at some time like during Noah's flood perhaps an ocean have you ever heard of a local African folk mentioned there ever being giants here I asked yes he stated matter of factly they had told him about giant men who used to live in that area in 1936, Lars and Cole, a German paleontologist and anthropologist, is said to have found footprints and bones of giant men on the shores of Lake Alasia in Central Africa who were 30 feet tall. In Transvale, South Africa, in Hava, more giants were found. African art is always interesting, but like this well-done figure, some of it is really bizarre. But then so are the accounts of giant men who, as Josephus, the Roman historian, said, had faces that were not like ordinary men. So they would be very odd looking if they were that big. They would be very different. They're, 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 I mean, obviously, that goes without saying. They would be probably pretty scary looking, okay? I'm sure. And anyway, if you, if you go by the account that the men of, when they went into Canaan said, what'd they say? And these guys are scary. So we're like grasshoppers. Makes sense, doesn't it? Makes a lot of sense when you start looking at it. All right. And then there's more here. Another account here. 
Let's see, where are we at here? Page 53. I want to give you one of these. A giant coffin was found, okay? Um, they found it in Arizona. In 1891, while digging in Arizona, in Crittenden, Arizona, men uncovered a granite coffin that would have held a man 12 feet tall. No bones are reported, but the incision on the side of the coffin of a foot with six toes agrees with the biblical description of giants. That's, they didn't find a person, but they found the incision for six toes there. Interesting, isn't it? Why? Because the Bible's true and evolution is a lie. That's why. That's why. The Bible's true. So do you I, I don't understand all of it. Amen. I just believe it. I just, I just believe it. In Santa Rosa Island, uh, off the coast of California, on Santa Rosa Island, a giant's remains were found. It had double rows of teeth. These islands tend to be deep layers of sand. This probably means that it was a post-flood giant. So they had the double rows of teeth again. Uh, mentioned over and over again, it seems like. Uh, double rows of teeth. You know, always, always something that seems to be mentioned quite a bit uh, in, in these accounts. It's, it's very fascinating, actually. All right, and then uh, Death Valley Giants here. Here's one. A fellow named Dan told me of a race of giants living near Death Valley and that two men who were wandering in the desert mountainsides found a series of caves inside where things such as large chairs, tables, far too large for normal humans. Death Valley in the Mojave Desert, east of Los Angeles, California. It is the lowest and driest place in the Western Hemisphere. In Death Valley, California, 1947, it was reported in a local newspaper that amateur archaeologists had discovered a skeleton nine feet tall. Who claimed that they found what appeared to be the bones of tigers and dinosaurs and in with, in with giant human remains. Good question. He, the author asked, where is all this stuff? Where's it go? Would there be somebody trying to destroy this evidence so it wasn't there? Would there be somebody trying to rid the evidence, so you didn't find it, or you didn't see it, or it wasn't. Why? Why would they advertise? How can we see so much stuff about UFOs and everything else? Why don't we see any of this stuff? Why don't we hear about any of this stuff? Why aren't any real scientists observing these things and giving us evidence of these things? Why? I got another one for you. Why are most creation scientists too scared of this? Let me ask you that. Why are these big name creation scientists like Kent Ham never talk about this stuff? Why is he so silent about all this? The information is out there. It's all right there. Why does he want to be so silent about it? Why doesn't he ever talk about it? Right. Do you know what they're worried about? Just like the same reason they won't come out for geocentricity. You want to know why? Because they don't want to be counted as a fool by the world. Well, sign me up and put me in line. I'll be fool number one for the world because I don't care. I believe the word of God. And I don't care what some scientist says. I care what the Bible says what the Word of God says, and the evidence of the Scriptures. And I'll, I'll spend my days believing this book before I believe their garbage and fairy tale that they made up called evolution. The Bible says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And their foolish heart was darkened. And they worshipped the creature more than the Creator, who is God-blessed forever. Bunch of God haters is what they are. You better believe I believe wholeheartedly they're running around destroying as much evidence as they can and taking as much evidence as they can and destroying it. Why? Because they don't want the truth to come out. They want you to believe the lie of evolution because it's the religion of the devil, that's why, and it leads men to hell. And that's what they want. They want men to go to hell. They don't want men to believe the Bible. Oh, you can't believe that, can you? I absolutely believe that. I absolutely 100% believe it. I, I believe it so much, I'll yell about it. I believe it so much, I'll go out in that street and preach it. I'll believe it so much that I stand before professors and people like that, and I preach the Word of God to them. And I call their proud hearts to repentance. Because I believe what this book says. If this book wasn't real, I got no reason to be here today. Tell you that right now. I'd go make a couple hundred thousand dollars and live it up for the rest of my life. Amen. But it's real.
Near Brewersville, Indiana, in 1879, from a stone burial mound, the remains of a skeleton nine feet eight inches long was excavated. A Mika necklace was around its neck, reported in the Indianapolis News, November 10th, 1975. Hmm. I bet you if you tried to find out where that was, you wouldn't be able to track it down. Wonder why. In 1965, in East Central Kentucky, along Holly Creek, a skeleton eight feet nine inches was found under a ledge of rock. Eight feet nine inches. How about that? Hey, Minnesota! Want to hear one about Minnesota? How about that? Yay! Finally! As much ice as here, there's got to be some frozen somewhere around here, right? Man. In Warren, Minnesota, in 1883, 10 skeletons of both males and females were excavated from a mound. It was said they were of gigantic size. The find was reported in the St. Paul Pioneer Press, May 23, 1883. In Minnesota, unknown locality, possibly Clearwater, in 1888, seven skeletons, seven to eight feet tall, were reported on in the St. Paul Pioneer Press, June 29, 1888. Another account, but probably of the same find, says that in Clearwater, Minnesota, skeletons of seven giants were excavated in mounds, that they had receding foreheads and complete double rows of teeth. See, we got some giants around here. I'm telling you. In Lake Coronas, Minnesota, on the Beckley Farm, the skeleton of a huge man was uncovered. At Moose Island and also at Pine City, Minnesota, more bones of giant men were discovered, reported in the St. Paul Globe. August 12th, 1896. These are all too small to have been mastodons. However, a word of caution, in some cases, bones of mastodons have been misidentified as giant men's bones. But since many mastodons as well as mammoths have been found since white men settled in these states, it is likely that people knew the difference, especially since many of them are in mounds or in places obviously made by men. See, we haven't even really talked about that, but these mounds that were created, these mounds, there's, there's a lot of deep, okay, you know like the design of the Egyptian pyramids and all that stuff? What's that? Yeah, yeah, we're going to do a show on us, right? We're going to have to. But mounds, I mean, they, they, the way they're designed are the same way the pyramids are designed. Everything's the same the, the, because the, the, the spirit is the same within them. They were doing something. They, were, they, were, they, were, they advertise what they believe, just like you do. When somebody knows when you have a Christian burial, they know. Okay, when you have a different kind of burial, you know. When they build these mounds and they created these, well, anyway, we'll talk about it some other time. We don't have time to go into it right now. But anyway, Clearwater, Minnesota, June 29, 1888. The St. Paul paper carried a story about Charles Pinkerton of Carina, Minnesota. Where is Carina, Minnesota? Dan, you know where Carina, Minnesota is? Come on, Dan. Nope, don't know it. Okay. All right. Me neither. I don't know where it is either. Who on June 28, 1980, or 19, 1888, excuse me, was digging a cellar or a well on a sort of of Knoll for his house when he hit the well-preserved skeletons of people seven feet tall and some giants of eight feet tall, buried with their heads down. The teeth and jaws were sound, he said, but not like the teeth of the people of his day. He estimated them to be at least 200 years old, about mid-1600s, because there was a stump of a tree two feet wide on top of the mound. Hmm. Why? I mean, how, how do you find this stuff? Because the Bible's real, and the Bible said there were giants. Then some of these men, let me, let me explain something to you. Some of these men are not what you would call, you know, the, sons of, the offspring of the sons of God and daughters of men. Some of them were big men. Some of them were just big men. They were giants. They were of giant size. They were different than us, because before the flood, there were people that were different than us. And even after the flood, there were some things. But either way, whether they are or not, or whatever time period they come from, they all destroy evolution. And that's why they are hidden and buried in the ground, never to be found or destroyed, because we cannot have these come out, because then that would prove that we are not evolving. We are not getting better. So they cannot, they, they, they cannot, you know, the Missouri, the Missouri giant, the show me state, Missouri, How about that. A mound in Kansas City, Missouri held the remains of a man and tracks 25 to 30 feet tall. Unfortunately, most of these hundreds of mounds were dug into the 1800s and much of the bones destroyed or carted off to basements of major institutions, never to be seen again. 
Yep, got to get rid of those, don't we? The Choctaw story. Some stories challenge our modern biases. This is one. After coming to the Mississippi River, the Choctaw Indians encountered a race of white giants who came from the east. Listen to this. And used the mammoth as beast of burdens. The mammoths were herded and broke down the forest. Though they were peaceful farmers, they had been cannibals. Having been a powerful people, they were now dwindling and disappeared when the Choctaw came. So they wrote of that in their history. Did the Choctaw make all this up? He says, I apologize for any evolutionist who is having a coronary over this. But are you calling the Choctaw liars? <laughs> the language of the Choctaw. Chickasaw and Crick of the... <laughs> That's funny, isn't it? Montana is known for its vast layers of dinosaurs. I have excavated several sites there, says the author, but just as interesting and infinitely rare is the discovery in 1903 of a man nine feet tall next to a woman I'm almost as tall. Whoa, that's a big woman. The excavation was done by Professor S. Farr. So yeah, there were nine foot tall guys and nine foot tall women. But wouldn't they want to get them into pro wrestling? I'm telling you. Nine foot tall women. That is one big lady. I wouldn't tell her that, though. I don't know how big the babies were. I don't even, I, only a mother would think of that. Only a mom would think of that. But I'm telling you, a big baby. You ladies can thank God. You weren't married to a giant. Bad stuff, wouldn't it? <laughs> How about the Lovelock Nevada Giants with long red hair? You know, that's interesting. They talk about red hair a lot with giants if you study history. For years I've heard of the, lo long, of the long red haired giants of Lovelock Nevada. That's kind of a tongue twister. The photos available were difficult to get an accurate idea of their dimension. But a soldier in the Army, Mr. Pete Monsor, in 2010 was able to look at some of the giant skulls and get good photographs. Most of the giant mummified bodies were apparently taken to the Smithsonian or to the Nevada Historical Society. I wonder why that happened. You know, take it to the Smithsonian. Several people have told me over the years that the Smithsonian was supposed to have excavated 69 giant mummified humans with long red hair in 1911. The scientists were apparently not denying that their remains were large men, but they exclaimed that the red hair was due to the fact they were buried in bat guano, which had turned black hair red. I asked Cheyenne Eugene Black Bear, 80 years old at the time, about the story, and he said the men were cannibals and bad men. The normal Indians, the Paiute, told the giants to stop their bad ways, but they wouldn't, so the Paiute killed them. Nice. Henry Johnson talked to the folks of Lovelock and was told that the Paiute caught the giants in the cave and started a big fire in it and suffocated them. Well, that is one smart Indian. You're going to smoke them out. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's what he did. Smoked them in. Stop eating, people. We're going to cook you. <laughs> It's all there is to it. You're getting cooked. Stuck him in a cave and cooked him. You want to eat people? Here you go. You're stuck in a cave. Mr. Black Bear said that these men were also 10 feet tall. Other reports say they are 7 feet tall. Perhaps they were both. And then again, other reports say that Nevada Historical Society no longer considers them giants. Oh, of course. So take it for what it's worth. The lady at the Humboldt Museum in Winnemucca, Mucca? I don't know, Nevada told Ian Juby, hey, I know Ian Juby. Nate, you sent me a video of Ian Juby. Yeah, that one skull they had was 12 inches tall. Grand Canyon Giants researcher Bob Gibson said the daughter of the Indian chief, Winnemucca, wrote down all these stories. At the time of the Giants, apparently much of Nevada was a giant lake, Lahontan Sea, with a huge population of Indians. These Giants were said to be very violent. They seem to be a pattern in stories of giant men. Everywhere, everything we hear, the Paiute Indians that area in Nevada, whose average height was much more than five feet tall, told, their con told of their conflicts with the race of red-haired giant men who were driven from Nevada by the alliance of several Indian tribes. The giant red-headed men were, were called the Sai Tikas. Speculation is that there is a tie-in to the seven giants, 10-foot-tall mummies found in Kossuth, Iowa, Stone Monument, 
who also had red hair. At one time, the Kosuth County chapter of the State Historical Society had three robes made entirely of very long strands of red hair. Accordingly to John Williams' report, DNA samples were taken from the red hair and the mummies to see if there was a relationship. But we'll never know. Because we aren't going to be told. Right? Can't know that information, can you? All right, uh, let's see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop... I'm going to stop right here, okay? And I'll pick it up in the afternoon, and then we'll still have time for Nate to preach, and that's what we'll do this afternoon, okay? Because I just stop that and put it all on one, okay? All right, let's do that right now. We'll just stop and pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your words. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the truth of the Scriptures, the foundation, but also the evidence that you've left for us to make these scientists look like a bunch of fools that mock you. Lord, I just pray that some would hear the truth and be saved, that some would turn from the foolishness of humanism, foolishness of that doctrine of evolution, doctrine of devils. They would embrace Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.